Senator from Georgia. I'd ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be officiated. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, I appreciate the distinguished majority whip, and I voted with the distinguished majority whip last week on the interchange fees on debit cards. I thought it was a good amendment. I thought it was the right thing to do. But I take issue. Don't generically accuse those of us in this body of stonewalling a bill or more or less being interested in looking out for Wall Street or anybody else. I think a little history lesson is due for all of us. First of all, what brought us into this recession was the subprime market, which the distinguished gentleman mentioned, and the housing market. And it happened because members of this body and members of the body down the way 13 years ago began the direction to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to include in their portfolios a portion of which were called affordable housing loans, which were the words for what became subprime loans. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae created the market that allowed Wall Street to go find capital and collect that capital, pay a, put a high premium on the capital, high interest rate, maybe 200 basis points over going rate, but then make it to higher credit risk lenders because that's the way credit works. Of course, what happened is those loans became so popular, and because you had a government-sponsored entity that began the consumption of those loans, they proliferated. They were sold, those securities were sold around the world. And when they collapsed, and we went all through that, it was a terrible collapse. But the root of this problem is that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and the direction of the United States Congress as to what they should do in their portfolio in terms of the securities that they owned. And I'm not pointing fingers at a party, I'm saying the Congress of the United States. And to think that with that being true, and I don't think anybody can dispute it, we have a financial reform bill in front of us that exempts Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae from reform. That doesn't make any sense at all. And if you listen to the argument in the debate as to why they weren't there, it's because it was too hard. Well, listen, these are hard times. Americans are having hard times. It's time that we did the hard things. And it's time we not try and politically label this as friends of Wall Street or friends of Main Street. We're all Americans. It's our economy. It's not just part of the economy. And I take issue with labeling that takes place sometimes in this body. Let's, let's talk about the facts that are there one way or another, and let's let the facts determine what we do. I didn't vote for cloture because I don't think it is right to leave Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae outside the equation and incorporate every other business on Main Street and on Wall Street to the extent that we had. And I think it's right for us to take some of the blame in the Congress of the United States. A lot of this wouldn't have happened had we not directed the government-sponsored entities that we had influence with and the implied full faith and credit of the United States taxpayers would be the consumers that would create the liquidity for subprime loans. So my only statement to the distinguished majority whip is this. I understand facts, and the facts are that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae started this. They're exempt from this piece of legislation, and I, for one, take issue that you cannot reform and address the concerns that happen if you don't address all the root of the problem. And I yield back the balance of my time and yield to the Senator from Illinois. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, at, at the risk of a real debate in the Senate floor, I'd invite the Senator from Georgia to stay on the floor, if he would, for a moment, so we can engage one another for a moment. Thank you. I'd, I'd just say to the Senator from Georgia, I have the highest respect for him personally, and I thank him for his support on my interchange amendment. We worked on many other issues, and we will again in the future. Uh, I will concede that this, what you've pointed to is a fundamental flaw, a mistake that was made. There was a presumption made that um, owning a home was such a valuable American ideal, and I know your background in real estate, you certainly agree with that, but we, we went too far. We extended the opportunity for home ownership to people who weren't ready. Uh, and we believe that uh, if you pushed them to the limit, how much they could pay, that the home would appreciate in value, their incomes would go up, and everything would work out. And it turned out that gamble was wrong on some people. And certainly Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as the ultimate guarantors of mortgages, were part of that. So there is a governmental uh, element here. I don't question that for a moment. So. Certainly some blame lies there. Blame lies with those people who overextended, bought more than they could afford. They may have been misled or uh, uh, into it, but the fact is they did it, and they made mistakes. Having said that, though, there were a lot of people involved in financial institutions which led them into this, misled them into this. 
no-doc closings where people didn't even have to present a document proving the amount of income that they had, uh, basically set, telling people we're going to give you a, a mortgage where it's, uh, you're going to be paying just interest for a few years and it'll catch up with you and everything be just fine. These uh, mortgages where the interest rates would explode in the out years and people wouldn't be able to pay. There was a lot of, of things that went wrong there. But I hope the gentleman from Georgia will agree that behind this bill is the notion that some things happened on Wall Street which were outrageous. And I think the fact that we ended up coming up with somewhere in the range of seven or eight hundred billion dollars to save those Wall Street institutions is an in indication that things were out of hand on Wall Street, that we never want to return to that again. Now, I will say, I'll concede to the general, gentleman from Georgia his, his premise. Do we need to reform Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Yes, we do. And if we don't, we're going to pay dearly for it. I don't know that we can accomplish it in this bill, uh, accomplish it at this moment, but it literally has to be done. I've never quarreled with that premise, that starting point in the debate and conversation, nor do I question your starting point that this was part of the problem that led to where we are today. But, you know, it's always the best is the enemy of the good around here. And we have a good Wall Street reform bill that moves in the right direction to avoid some of the abuses there. And to argue that it doesn't include Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and therefore we can't support it, I, I think this, perhaps we just have a different point of view. I think this is a valuable thing to do and move forward. And I will concede your point. I think you're right in what you said. I'd say to the Senator from Georgia. Well, Senator from Georgia. The gentleman would yield. I will yield. I appreciate the comment, and that was my main point that I wanted to make when I was listening to the gentleman's speech. I first of all got a little irritated, then I realized I've probably done the same thing before too. I, I, I leaped at the point I wanted to make and leaped over some facts that really belonged to be in the debate. And the fact of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and the fact that we, the Congress of the United States, directed Freddie and Fannie to own a percentage of their portfolio in subprime loans was the source of the capital that bought the first securities that created the subprime securities. I do not argue that there are not good things in this bill. In fact, when the gentleman was referring to Alte and stated income loans, or liar loans as we call them, in the industry at the time they existed. It was the Isaacson Landrew Amendment that we successfully added to this bill that defined what a, what a qualified loan is to be exempt from risk potential because it requires the stated, it requires income verification, it requires a, an employer statement that the employee is hired, and it requires an income ratio that's sufficient to retire the debt that's borrowed. And I agree exactly with the gentleman what he said. My point was that when all of us make these remarks of what bills are and they are not, we ought to include all of the facts that are in there, not just a selected few. And I appreciate the gentleman's comments, and I was proud to be a part of his amendment. This, uh, my colleague from Georgia, and I, I guess it just depends on your perspective. Uh, that amendment you just described that you added to the bill is a valuable part of this bill. And it wasn't there originally, it is now. And I'm glad it is part of it. And I happy to support it. And that's what we're trying to do today, to move it to passage so it becomes the law of the land. But because we fell short by only two Republican votes coming forward today, we can't move forward. Now, it, if the position of the gentleman is we shouldn't pass his amendment or this underlying bill until we reform Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I'm with you in terms of the reformation. I just don't believe it is reasonable to require this bill to do everything that needs to be done. That's my, my only difference, perhaps, with the gentleman from Georgia. The gentleman and I might differ on Georgia. points, but I defer to the gentleman. I, I wish I had the control to control votes. I really don't. There are two on your side and two on ours, and there are people with higher pay grades who are responsible for that. But I just did want to make the point about what is, to me, a serious issue with regard to the bill and something should be considered in the entire debate. My, my, my good friend from Georgia, I, 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 I don't mean to jump into these things, but I, I, I just want to make a couple of comments. First of all, no one, no one knows real estate like Johnny Isaacson. And uh, I've had the privilege, Mr. President, of working with the Senator from Georgia over the last year or so on a couple of proposals, one of which I think made a big difference, and I thank him for it, and that was the $8,000 tax credit uh, for home buyers uh, to go out and to encourage uh, home purchases and sales. And it's proven to be pretty, pretty worthwhile. I haven't seen the latest data. My friend from Georgia is far more familiar with it than I am. But clearly, for most Americans, that home ownership is the single largest and most important acquisition they ever have. It's the greatest wealth creator for most Americans. As the senator from Illinois points out, that traditional trajectory where equity increases 
and people use that equity over years to help in their retirement and uh, student loans, a variety of things that they, they need as a family. And as, as uh, my friend from New Hampshire pointed out the other day, and there's a history here, and I, I acknowledge that we in Congress have failed in this responsibility, actually going back to around 2003, I think, and the senator from Alabama can correct me, but there were various attempts. Uh, a good friend of ours, obviously the former chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Mike Oxley, a, a member of the Republican Party, offered as chairman of the committee over there. They actually got one done. It was a bipartisan bill in the House uh, on Fannie and Freddie in, I think, 2005. It then came to the Senate, and things got bogged down over here. There were various attempts, including the former chairman from Alabama, offered a proposal as well. Senator Sarbanes did back and forth. And we didn't get the job done. And I think it's important during times like this when we're not hesitant to point an accusing finger at other institutions for having helped create this problem, we in Congress collectively did not get the job done with Fannie and Freddie. So I joined them with my colleague from Illinois. I think it's important we acknowledge that. If we're going to be sitting there and accusing other institutions for malfeasance or misfeasance, in this case, we should have done a better job at this. Here's the problem. As the Senator of New Hampshire pointed out, and I'm quoting him, this issue, to quote him, this issue is too complex for this bill. <laughs> and the reason is, is we don't really know what to, uh, what to replace it with at this point. There are a number of ideas floating around because all of us recognize we need to have a housing financing system in place. In the absence of having any in place, around 97 percent of all home mortgages are backed by the federal government today. If we pull that reg out at this particular juncture, I, I don't know what the implications would be. I think they'd be pretty profound and serious. So we're caught in this quandary, acknowledging the need to reform and replace Fannie and Freddie with the present structure. But doing so without replacing it with something could pose serious problems in the very area that the senator from Georgia is so knowledgeable in, that is, how do we continue to promote home ownership, which is critically part of our economic growth. Uh, so what we all we did, and I'd be the first to admit, uh, having the author of the provision here, it's fairly anemic <laughs> in light of what we need to be doing. But we've said here we are mandating that there be a, a, a study completed with options presented within, I think, six months. I forget the exact wording of the amendment. And the President of the United States, at least I've heard him say it on one occasion, maybe more, that this is a top priority uh, come next January for him and this Congress to grapple with. Now, again, there's nothing there that absolutely requires it, but it would be essential that we come up with the options. I recall the previous Secretary of the Treasury advocating for a public utility concept to replace Fannie and Freddie. I'd be the last one to tell you whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's one option that's out there. Clearly, when you have the conflicting goals, one of home ownership, which is the very one we all support, combined with the goal of satisfying shareholder interest. And what happened, of course, is shareholder interest trumped in a sense, the, the kind of manageable, sensible policy that would promote home ownership at the expense of returning investments for shareholders. Now, again, that's also a laudable goal. But to have the same entity have the two missions, one for home ownership, one for return on investment, they collided with each other. And we've ended up in the situation we're in without a great answer yet <laughs> as to how to replace it. So my, my, my point, I guess, I'm making is I, I totally agree with your, your premise. <laughs> The question is, as chairman of this committee, I didn't know how, given the, how do we fix this thing at this point, and I've never suggested with this bill that we were dealing with every financial problem in the country. I mean, it'd be an impossible task for us to take that on. So all I can say to you as someone who won't be here next January, uh, that, that, that I hope whoever sits in this chair at this desk or at this desk, possibly my good friend from Alabama chairing the committee, that this will be a priority of our committee, Banking Committee. I can't dictate that. I can't even bind the next Congress constitutionally with anything we require here. But my fervent hope would be, I can't think of a more important priority for the Banking Committee of the United States Senate than to have the reform of Fannie and Freddie, because I think we're going to be in deeper and deeper trouble, both financially and in terms of home ownership, if we don't. So whatever else happens here in the next few days with regard to this bill, I want to thank my friend from Georgia for his continuing issue, a commitment to the issue, and to say that I associate myself with his concerns, and I make a common plea with him, that while not in this bill, uh, and while I, I would also plead that the failure to deal with that in this bill 
ought not to be justification from walking away from all the other good things we're trying to accomplish in this legislation. And I thank him for hanging around and listening to this, uh, to this filibuster. <laughs> the gentleman yield for one, one comment. I'd be happy to yield to my First of all, my comments were directed specifically to the speech of the gentleman from Illinois and, and were not in a criticism of the chairman, first of all. I think the ranking member would certainly rank that. Second of all, there's some good news that was received today thanks to your help because I could not have done it if it wasn't for you. The tax credit that we extended and ultimately passed, which terminated April 30th, the numbers now from the most recent month's average sales price in the 20 top markets in America for the first time in 36 months, those prices went up by six-tenths of one percent. So the distinguished chairman deserves a lot of credit for that contribution as well. I was just making sure that there was a voice over here that reminded everybody of what got us in this to begin with in the context of the speech from the gentleman from Illinois. It was never a criticism of the chairman of the committee. Thank my friend from Georgia. And uh, with that, Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum.